Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you for this uh, introduction. You made my introduction easier, almost redundant, but uh, much easier. Tonight's speaker, Dr. Xavier Lufin, is not only a teacher of Arabic language and literature at the Free University of Brussels and of Arabic dialects at the Catholic University in Louvain, both in Belgium, but also an author, auditor, and translator. Professor Lofin has focused much of his academic research on the Arabic literature of Africa, including the representations of African and Arabic literature and the prescription or often, sorry, perception of African Americans in Arabic fiction. It is difficult to describe the depth and span of his research in such a short introduction. One only has to look at his publications to realize how dynamic a scholar we have and the privilege of receiving in our lecture series tonight. To name but a few, he is the author of a book on the fiction and the reality, as well as the reality of the fiction, as well as a reality of the fiction of the Arab Spring, as well as a linguistic study of Kinubi texts. He has edited and co-edited a number of publications. In addition to translating from Turkish and English, he has translated even more works written in Arabic including such writers as Nawal Saadawi, Yusuf Fadl, and Samir Naqash. The title of his lecture, From Timbuktu to Cape Town, The Place, the place of Arabic in Africa before and during colonial, colonial periods, is fascinating and the subject matter is new and revealing. Speaking of the word place, mobile phones have no place in this lecture. So please make sure you turn them off and let's welcome Professor Xavier Lofi. So first of all, uh, thank you. I'm very happy to be, to be here in Kuwait uh, tonight. It's my first visit uh, to Kuwait and uh, uh, I have to thank uh, um, the Dar al Athar al Islamiyya um, and uh, Sheikh Hussa, we, we had the opportunity to, uh, to speak this morning. Also, Catherine and all the people who made this, uh, this visit possible. So uh, I'm really grateful and very happy to be here in, in Kuwait. So I will uh, talk tonight ab about the um, Arabic manuscripts from Africa. And uh, why did I choose this, uh, this topic? Well, quite often in the, in the Western um, uh, academic literature, uh, Africa is related to oral tradition. And uh, uh, quite often, uh, people tend to oppose uh, the, the history of Africa as a kind of oral history. And uh, let's say, for instance, the, 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 the Western or even the, the Arab history, which would have been written by, uh, by historians in, in books. And I give you just one quotation among many others uh, illustrating this perception. Um, I quote, perhaps in the future there will be some African history to teach, but at present there is none. There is only the history of the Europeans in Africa. The rest is darkness. This perception of the history of Africa uh, was um, uh, uh, given by uh, Professor Trevor Roper in the 60s. And you still find uh, such uh, quotations because people uh, still tend to imagine that if you want to write the history of a country, you have to rely on written documents. Uh, it is not completely true because you can even rely on oral traditions when you, run, when you want to uh, write the history of a country. But uh, nevertheless, regarding Africa, 
it is wrong to imagine that uh, writing uh, didn't appear in Africa before the colonial period, as it is often said. And that's what I will try to show you tonight. Of course, because uh, b before I talk about the, um, the Arabic documents in Africa, I have to recall you that many scripts have been used in, uh, in, in Africa, or even many scripts were born in Africa uh, during the antiquity uh, until the Middle Ages. I just give you some examples here. Uh, in Egypt, of course, uh, everybody knows that uh, hieroglyphic, hieratic or demotic scripts uh, were uh, born and developed in Egypt um, since the, the third millennium before Christ uh, until, the, um, uh, until the end of the, uh, until the late uh, antiquity. In the same area, which is uh, southern Egypt and, uh, and northern Sudan, uh, there was another um, uh, writing system called the uh, Meroitic, which was used to uh, write down uh, the language uh, of the kingdom of Meroe in uh, northern Sudan, and that was during the, the third century before Christ until the fifth century after Christ, so BC. Uh, we could also mention uh, Coptic, uh, which uh, was written in a kind of Greek alphabet adapted to the, the Coptic language, and then Old Nubian, uh, which was also used in the northern Sudan uh, in the, the Christian kingdom of, the, of, of this part of Sudan. And actually it was, uh, again, a kind of a Coptic alphabet which was adapted uh, to the local language. One could also mention uh, Gehaz, uh, which is still uh, the official language of the Ethiopian uh, church. Uh, so Gehaz is not spoken anymore, but uh, the same script is used to write many other languages which are now used in, uh, in uh, Ethiopia as well as in Eritrea, like uh, Amharic, Tigray, Tigrinya, and some other languages. In Northern Africa, uh, one should mention Punic and uh, Old Libyan inscriptions, or also uh, Tifinar. So all those scripts from the, the, the third millennium before Christ until the Middle Ages have been in use in Africa. Of course, when I say that they were used in Africa, uh, it is mainly in the northern part of the continent. Uh, so the Maghreb, uh, Sudan, and, uh, uh, and Egypt. And uh, there is another uh, script that has been used in Africa, not only in this part of the, the continent, but in, very, uh, in, in many other parts of the, of the continent. Uh, it is, of course, uh, Arabic. And uh, the use of Arabic in Africa is directly related to the spread of Islam on the continent. It is quite a complicated uh, history because uh, it's a long process and uh, uh, it started uh, during the, the, the eighth century um, uh, when, when, when Islam was born and it didn't stop until the colonial period. It means that we have uh, very different uh, various cases uh, in Africa. In some cases uh, Arabic was used quite uh, uh, early in the history of the continent. In some other cases, uh, it started quite uh, late, like uh, sometimes uh, one or two decades before the arrival of the Europeans. So it is impossible to draw the history of the Arabic language and the Arabic script in Africa as a whole. And I will take uh, just uh, six, uh, six cases, six examples, uh, which tend to show different aspects of the history uh, of uh, Arabic in the country. Um, the, the first case uh, is the case of Timbuktu, and uh, then I will uh, talk a little bit about uh, Liberia, Senegal, Congo, South Africa, and the African diaspora. Starting with the Timbuktu, uh, Timbuktu may somehow be a, a kind of case study because when one thinks of the, the Arabic script, the history of the Arabic script in Africa, uh, Timbuktu may be the, one of the first uh, places which come to our mind. Uh, 
Uh, Timbuktu is located now in the, in the center of uh, Mali, and the city is very old. Uh, it has been uh, founded around the beginning of the 11th century uh, by some uh, uh, Berbers coming from the Sanhaja tribe from uh, northern Africa. Uh, which means that when uh, the first Europeans arrived in Timbuktu, and the first European visitor of Timbuktu uh, was a French called René Caillé, so he arrived in Timbuktu in 1828. Uh, at that time, Timbuktu uh, was already a place of culture since more than 700, uh, uh, 700 years, so it's quite a long period. Uh, the city was uh, uh, founded in the beginning of the 11th century, the, the beginning of the 12th century, sorry, the end of the, the 11th century, but the, the, the development of the city dates back to mainly the 14th century, uh, with the growth of, uh, of the, the, the trade with the northern Africa. And uh, the, 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 we can say that uh, the period between the 14th and the 17th century is really the era of economic and intellectual growth. So the, 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 some of the documents I will show to you uh, today uh, date back to this period. So uh, we have some uh, important uh, historical landmarks uh, about the, 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 the history of this city. Uh, as I told you, the 14th century was the beginning of the, the real development of the city, and that was at that time that Mansa Musa, the king of uh, Timbuk, the, the king of Mali, sorry, uh, made his pilgrimage to Mecca, and so uh, on his way to Mecca, he also visited uh, Cairo, and we have some testimonies in the, the, the Arabic historical sources uh, telling us uh, um, the history of this king. Uh, at the same period, we also have the, 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 the Moroccan uh, historian Ibn Battuta who visited uh, Mali and Timbuktu. And he describes, he has written a, an important book called uh, Ar Rihla, and he describes the city in, uh, and, and the whole kingdom in this book. Then, uh, from the, the 14th up to, the, to the, the, the 19th century, as you can see, uh, different rulers uh, came and uh, occupied the city. Uh, so people um, uh, from the Tuareg uh, tribes, then it, it became part of the Songhai Empire. In the 16th century, it became uh, part of uh, Morocco. And all those uh, cultural layers uh, brought, uh, of course, something new uh, to, uh, to the history uh, of uh, Timbuktu. Uh, According to the, um, uh, to the survey that, that uh, the, the surveys that have been made in the city, uh, if we take the, the libraries of Timbuktu and the surrounding villages, in Timbuktu alone, there may be something like one million uh, manuscripts all over the city. Uh, so you have to imagine that you don't have one library in the city, but uh, a series of uh, small libraries uh, related either to mosques, either to families. And uh, since the 70s, uh, the UNESCO tried to gather all those documents in, in one uh, public space and to analyze and to scan them. Uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, Timbuktu is quite well known today. And uh, I will show you uh, some of these documents, and I will uh, somehow classify them in two different groups. The first group is what I call the, uh, classic, uh, the classical Islamic tradition, which means the books that you could find in any other uh, library in the Islamic world. So I give you some examples, uh, like this copy of the Quran. So you have here uh, the uh, Surat Saad, as you can see, and uh, the, this copy uh, is... Uh, um, um, yes, is now located in uh, uh, Mama Haidara's uh, library. Um, another kind of document that you can find in Timbuktu 
uh, is, a, is a tafsir. As you can see here, you have uh, the explanation of uh, um, uh, Surat uh, Ali Amran. And so, a tafsir in Arabic is, a, is an explanation of the Quranic text. So, what you usually have is, I mean, the surah itself, like here, and then you have layers of explanations regarding the text. So, uh, you have a first layer of explanation, and then a second one here, and then a third one all over the text. Um, so, for instance, you have, you have here, قَالَ رَبِّي أَنِّي يَكُونَ لِي غُلَامٌ وَكَانَتْ مْرَاتِ عَاقِرًا and so on. And then you have some explanations about the grammar and also the meaning of uh, those, uh, those verses. This is, some, this is something very classical, which is not, I mean, specific to Timbuktu. Uh, another kind of uh, documents you find, uh, I will come back to this document because it's quite interesting, um, uh, it's um, here a document about fiqh, so about uh, Islamic law. As you can notice, most of those documents are related to religion, because for a long time in the Islamic world, and actually that was the same in the Western world, uh, religion was, I mean, the main part of the, of, the, of the culture. And so many, many documents are related to uh, to religion, whether it is Quran or the, the explanations of the Quran or here the, the Islamic law. But it is not the only kind of documents you can find in Timbuktu. You also have documents about mathematics and astronomy, for instance, as you can see here, uh, so with the four uh, directions, so uh, north, south, uh, west and east, and the division in 12 uh, burj. Uh, 12 uh, parts uh, of the sky. Here a document uh, about mathematics with some formulas here. Another kind of document uh, you can find in uh, Timbuktu uh, is about, uh, like this one, it, this one is a medical treatise um, about how to use some parts of animals to uh, produce medicines. Uh, but people were not only interested in Timbuktu, uh, in religion and sciences, but also in, somehow in, uh, you know, a kind of literature. And here you have uh, a copy of uh, a travelogue, which is, uh, in Arabic, the title is Tuhfat uh, al-Albab wa Nukhbat al-Gharaib. It has been written in the, the, the 12th century by uh, Abu Hamid al-Gharnati, and uh, it, it's, it's an interesting book, uh, because especially uh, this, uh, I, I, I don't know if you can read it uh, from, from there, but uh, this book is about the, the, the strange things that you can find all over the world, and especially in Africa. So it's funny to find a copy of this book in Africa itself, because, you know, um, for instance, you have here uh, I mean, a quotation saying, Wafi bilad al Sudan, Ummatun la ru'usa lahum, Zakarahum al Shahabi fi kitabihi siyar al Muluk, and so on. So, uh, in this uh, passage of the book, the author says that somewhere in Africa, uh, you have a population without heads, you know, and they, they walk around and they, they don't have any heads. You have another part of the book uh, talking about a country where uh, you will find only ladies, you will never find uh, men or boys. And so when, uh, when ladies uh, want to be pregnant, they have to bath in a, in a stream and then they will give birth to uh, girls only. Of course, all those stories are fantasies, but uh, it was very popular during the, 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 the 12th century. Uh, but as I said, the, 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 the interesting thing is that you find it back in Africa. So people somewhere in Africa were reading what people were talking about them, uh, thinking about them, sorry, uh, when they were in, uh, in, uh, in Spain at that time. Another kind of document is the, the story of uh, Alexander the Great. You know, Alexander the Great was, uh, I mean, 
We have different sources about his life. We have the official sources, the, the official history of Alexander the Great, and then we have a, a kind of a popular romance uh, which was uh, uh, widespread all over the Near East, and uh, we have translations uh, from, the, from Greek. We have translations of this text from Greek to Syriac, to Georgian, to Ethiopian, but also uh, some Arabic translations. And again, you find one of these translations in uh, Timbuktu. Another kind of book uh, or of documents that you can find in, um, in Timbuktu uh, is, uh, well, actually, this one, this one is not really an amulet, but a book explaining how to write amulets. So until now, all, all the documents that I, that I have shown are interesting because they show that uh, in Timbuktu, during the Middle Ages, people were reading exactly the same books as you could find in other parts of the Islamic world. Uh, if you take the catalog of, uh, of a library in Syria or in Egypt in the Middle Ages, you will roughly find more or less uh, the, same, the same kind of documents. Uh, this may explain partly why people, uh, why scholars were not, uh, until the 70s, really interested in the books which were found in, uh, in Africa. Uh, you know, the, the people dealing with the, the history of Africa uh, were focusing on the documents produced by Africans, and so they considered that if something was written in Arabic, it was not really belonging to the African heritage. And, uh, uh, on the other side, uh, when uh, you were talking with the Orientalists, they were not interested in what was produced in Africa because they were saying that it was too far from the center and that there was nothing very new in, 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 in those countries. So yes, you can find a lot of documents in those, uh, in those libraries, but you find the same documents in Syria and in Egypt. So why, analyzing, why should we analyze all those documents? Uh, actually, uh, this is not true at all. There was also a local production which was uh, um, written by uh, local scholars, and I will give you some examples of this. Uh, a first example uh, is a very important book uh, written by uh, Ahmad Baba. Ahmad Baba was, uh, um, was a scholar from Timbuktu, and he has written a book which is, uh, uh, which is uh, called Mi'raj uh, al-Su'ud fi Nail Majloub al-Sudan. And uh, this book is a kind of answer to uh, slave traders uh, from the area of Tuat. Tuat is now in uh, Algeria. And the people in Tuat uh, were uh, um, buying and selling uh, black slaves uh, using, I mean, a local tradition uh, that you can find all over the Islamic world, but also in the, the Christian and, and, and the Jewish traditions. S uh, and this is the tradition of the curse of Noah, you know. Um, uh, Ham, the son of Noah, uh, of, uh, Noah uh, was said to have seen his father naked, and so he, he, he loved uh, uh, of him. And his father, because he was uh, uh, upset, uh, cursed him and told him, uh, you, 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 your sons, Will, be, uh, will have a black skin, and they will be the slaves of the rest of the, of the world. Uh, this is, of course, um, a, a kind of legend, but it was widespread and used to justify slavery in Africa uh, by Muslim, but also Christian and Jewish traders. And what the Ahmad Baba tried to do in this uh, treatise is to show that it was a legend and that it was not based on, uh, on, uh, on legal uh, documents. So it's a, it's a very interesting document because it's a local production and it is related with uh, local issues like slavery. Uh, another kind of uh, documents which uh, were locally uh, produced is uh, this uh, chronicle, which is called The History of the Songhai Empire. So it has been written uh, at the very beginning of the 19th century by Sayyid al-Mukhtar ibn Ahmad al-Kunti. Uh, Sayyid al-Mukhtar al-Kunti belonged to, the, to a, a white family called al-Kunta, and they produced many scholars in Timbuktu and elsewhere. And uh, he gathered all the information he could find, uh, like oral traditions, but also written traditions, 
in the books of Timbuktu, and he wrote this book about the history uh, of the uh, Songhai Empire. Uh, if you remember the landmarks I put at the beginning uh, in one of the first uh, slides, uh, Songhai occupied uh, um, um, Timbuktu for, for a while. Um, the same uh, writer uh, also uh, wrote poetry. You have here one uh, Qasida from, of course, the same period, uh, uh, which was written uh, in Arabic. Another document uh, which uh, has been found in, um, in one of the Timbuktu libraries uh, is this one. Um, it, is a, it is a document uh, written in, again in the beginning of the 19th century by uh, Abdullah Danfodio. So uh, Abdullah Danfodio was a, a Fulani uh, scholar and he belonged to the family of uh, uh, Usman Danfodio, who is quite famous because he fought against the Europeans in West Africa. And uh, Abdullah Danfodio produced uh, many books in Arabic, but also in some other languages like Fulani. And uh, this is one of the examples of his writings. So when we look at all those documents, we see that, uh, uh, contrary to what is sometimes said in some sources, the, the African population was not just copying documents from outside, because we know that, uh, we know something about the origin of all those libraries. Um, many books were bought uh, from Morocco, um, and so we have Moroccan traders who were, I mean, coming to Timbuktu and selling those books. Then we also have people who were copying those books in situ and then uh, brought them to Timbuktu. Another source of documents uh, was the, um, the pilgrimage. When people were going to Mecca, uh, on the way back from Mecca, uh, they were uh, traveling through other cities like uh, Cairo, um, and they were also buying books de there, and then they were bringing them back to Timbuktu. So that's the origin of those uh, libraries. But as we can see here, we also have documents which have been produced in Timbuktu itself. And uh, the interesting thing is that most of those books are not found outside of Africa. You have some exceptions, like uh, the book of uh, Ahmad Baba. We have some copies also uh, uh, in Egypt, I think, and, well, some very few other books. But uh, most of the time, they were concentrated in uh, Western Africa. So it uh, contradicts the idea, first, that there were no manuscripts in, uh, in, in Africa before the arrival of the Europeans. If you take the case of Timbuktu, since, at least since the 14th century, those documents existed. But in addition to this, they were not mere copies of what was uh, written in other parts of the Islamic world. There was also an original uh, production. production sorry. Um, the originality of those documents uh, is not found only in the contents of the books, but also in, in their shape. I will give you some examples. Uh, there is a, a very specific way all over West Africa, from Senegal up to Chad, uh, to, uh, um, let's say, uh, not to bind, actually. Uh, actually, people were not really uh, binding the books, you know. If you find a book from the same period in, in Syria or in Egypt, you will find a binding like most of the books, uh, most of the Western books. But in Africa, uh, the pages were gathered together and put in a kind of a leather uh, pocket like this one. This is something specific from the African uh, writing tradition in Arabic. Uh, another uh, variation is the development of uh, local scripts. Uh, the, the Arabic scripts came to West, to, uh, West Africa uh, through Morocco and the Maghrib uh, in general. And so when you look at the scripts, they look like uh, Moroccan or, or, or Algerian scripts. But if you look carefully, uh, some of the scholars developed, I mean, uh, uh, some, some features which were specific uh, to uh, West Africa. And so specialists 
describe some some of the documents saying that uh, this one is writing in in um, is written uh, in a script called Sudani, uh, this other one in another script called uh, Suki, and so on. So exactly like uh, you have uh, different uh, Arabic scripts in the Near East or in the Middle East, you also have some uh, script uh, traditions inside Africa. A last very interesting uh, development uh, of the writing is the, the adoption of uh, uh, the Arabic script uh, in order to write down African languages. And here you have an example, um, if you look uh, carefully at what is this, what is said here you have هَذِهِ كِتَابَ الْعَجَمِ الْفُلَانِ لِلْفَقِيحِ الصَّالِحِ عَبْدَاللَّهِ and so on. So this uh, sentence says in Arabic that this book is written in Ajami, Fulani. Ajami is a term used in Africa to describe the African languages which were written down uh, with the Arabic script. And so this document, the introduction is in Arabic but the, the core of the text is in, uh, is in Fulani. We also have similar texts in other uh, African languages like uh, Hausa and so on. So that's something all those uh, features uh, uh, make the documents from Timbuktu uh, very, very specific and, and, uh, and quite original. A second case is the one of Liberia. Uh, as you know, Liberia, um, uh, why did I choose this case? Uh, Timbuktu is a, is a city, it was a big city, uh, founded uh, very early. Uh, when, the, when the Europeans arrived in Liberia, the situation was quite different. It was a, quite a rural area with very small uh, towns. You don't have big, big towns like uh, Timbuktu. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, even in those uh, uh, small towns, you could find uh, Arabic documents. Uh, how do we know this? Uh, when the Americans uh, began to send back uh, freed slaves to Africa, you know, that's, what, that's the origin of Liberia. Uh, they, 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 they decide to send uh, uh, freed slaves uh, back to Africa and they settled them in uh, Liberia. And uh, one of the intellectuals uh, coming from uh, West Indies, his name is Edward Blyden, which was sent back to Africa, was uh, actually he was, um, he was a priest, but he was very interested in uh, Islamic culture. And he visited different parts of Liberia. And he says in one of his books, for instance, that he visited a small town, a small town which is called Boporo. So that's uh, the picture doesn't date back from the same time, of course. That's the, the beginning of the 20th century. But to give you an idea of, you know, you can see the landscape. It's, it's, it's the, it, the village is uh, located in the forest. But when Edward Blyden visited the city, he said that he met, uh, I mean, a local scholar who was teaching uh, Quran to the, to the kids in the village. And... Uh, he was not only, uh, um, uh, he didn't know uh, the, the Quran only, but he, wa he had also some other books in his own library. Uh, for instance, he had some poems written by uh, Al Hajj Omar, which is a, a famous uh, Fulani intellectual from West Africa. And more interesting, uh, he had a copy of the Maqamat written by Al Hariri. So uh, this is uh, poetry dating back to the, the, the uh, the 12th century, and uh, you could find copy of such a book even in rural Liberia in the, in the mid-19th century. So it means that you don't find Arabic documents in big cities only, but also in small areas like this. Uh, another testimony from the same period, so Edward Blyden wrote about this in uh, 1860, around the same period, uh, uh, Benjamin Anderson, was, he was an, um, an African-American who went back to Africa and he became a Liberian. And he made a kind of expedition uh, in some villages of uh, Liberia. And he received a letter uh, written by a local chief. The, the local chief is not an Arab, he's, an, he's a Mandingo. So he belongs to the Mandingo tribe. And as you can see, he was able to uh, write quite a long letter uh, in Arabic, uh, which was then given uh, to Benjamin Anderson, and he was supposed to give this to the, to the Liberian uh, government. 
But you can see that even in small areas, Arabic was a middle of communication uh, between people. Another interesting case uh, is the case of Senegal. Uh, in Senegal, you, you find, uh, as in Timbuktu, many uh, classical documents, as I call them. You know, so uh, copies of Quran, uh, explanations of Quran, and so on. But you also have, again, a local production. For instance, here you have a, you have a poem, a Sheher, uh, which is written, I mean, the poem uh, uh, is about a, a battle between Bademba and Bilima. And Bademba uh, won uh, the, the fight. And so you can see the beginning of the, of the, of the poem, Alhamdulillah, ala man a'ana Bademba fi qital qawm Bilima. So uh, let's say, thanks, uh, let us thank God who helped uh, Bademba in his uh, battle against uh, Bilima. And then you have the whole poem ending uh, almost always with the name of the, the, the one who, uh, so Bilima. Um, so that's uh, local uh, production. Another kind, uh, another example of uh, local production is a manuscript in a Wolof. So I told you that in Timbuktu, you find documents written in African languages like uh, Hausa and Fulani. You can find such documents in uh, Senegal as well, in Fulani, but also in Wolof. So Wolof is, I mean, the, is today the main language uh, in use in, uh, in, um, uh, in, um, in Senegal. And you can find many documents written in this uh, African language with the Arabic script. But one of the most uh, interesting phenomena, I think, in Senegal is uh, what uh, did the French uh, do when they, when they realized that Arabic was uh, already uh, used in the country, uh, you find here an official document, that's the official journal published by the, the, the colonial power in Senegal. And you can see that it is bilingual, so it's a, it's a, it's a weekly official journal where you find all the official I mean, decisions taken by the government. And the French colonial power decided to publish all those information in both languages, which means not only that Arabic was, I mean, widespread enough in the country uh, to be used in, uh, as, an, uh, as, a, as a mean of uh, communication, but also that uh, the, the French authorities decided to uh, produce bilingual documents. This one dates back to the end of the 19th century, but we also have treaties between, uh, signed between, uh, I mean, local African chiefs and the French authorities, and they are also bilingual, French and Arabic. Uh, so it's a kind of recognition uh, by the colonial power of the presence of Arabic in the country. Uh, you, you can find uh, similar examples in uh, northern Nigeria. When the British uh, came and colonized uh, uh, northern Nigeria, the, the, the British officers who were uh, working in northern uh, Nigeria were obliged to learn Arabic and Hausa written in Arabic. So it means also that the British rulers, uh, at least for, for a period, decided to give, I mean, a, a specific status to Arabic uh, in the country. Another case, uh, which is, I mean, especially as a Belgian, uh, quite interesting is what happened in uh, Congo. As you know, uh, Congo was colonized by uh, the Belgians. But when the, the Europeans arrived in Congo, uh, let's say roughly in the 1880s, uh, they had been preceded by uh, Arabs and Swahilis. And they were, I mean, they came from uh, Sudan and settled down in this area, and from, uh, from Tanzania, and they settled down in this area. And in the Belgian archives, we have um, dozens of documents produced by Arab traders or Swahili traders in Arabic. They were found in situ in uh, eastern Congo and uh, northeastern, northeastern Congo. And well, again, it is interesting, but not exceptional. Uh, since they were Arab traders, it's quite logical that they were writing, that they were using Arabic. 
What is more interesting is what happened with some of the uh, local uh, uh, chiefs. If, you, if I go back to, uh, to the map, uh, there, there is an African population here uh, called Azende. And uh, the, the, the Azende chiefs uh, were in contact with Sudanese traders. And when they noticed that the Sudanese traders um, had a, 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 a huge network and that writing was helping them to, 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 to develop this network, they decided to use Arabic as well. But because they did not know the language, uh, they, they were hiring um, people from Sudan and from Chad who were able to write, and so they were dictating them letters, and those people were uh, writing. Uh, so they, 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 they had a kind of, you know, each sultan had a kind of uh, Arab uh, secretary in charge of, the, of his correspondence. And so that's quite interesting because you have African sultans who uh, somehow appropriated the Arabic language. They decided to use it even if they could not, they could not write it. We have, it uh, we have some cases in northern Congo, but also in uh, eastern Congo. Then, even more interesting, when the Europeans arrived in this area, the, 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 some of the local chiefs sent them letters in Arabic. That's the case of this letter. This letter in Arabic was sent to a Belgian officer in northern Congo. And of course, at the beginning, the Belgian officer could not know, well, he didn't know what to do with those documents. So the, the, the Belgian colonial uh, authorities uh, hired uh, people from the Middle East, mainly from Iraq and, um, uh, and Egypt, and they came to Congo and they worked as translators uh, for, the, for the colonial authorities. And they produced documents like this one. So this document is an answer dictated by a Belgian officer and written by an Egyptian translator who then sent the letter to a to an Azande chief. So it means that at the very beginning, at the very beginning of the colonial uh, period in Congo, Arabic was somehow recognized uh, by the colonial authorities and used by them. Uh, another example, uh, I, told, uh, I told you that some African languages were written in Arabic uh, in uh, Western Africa. That was also the case in Eastern Africa. And one, uh, there was uh, one language in particular, which is Swahili. Uh, Swahili is now uh, written in uh, Latin script. But the first documents in Swahili, uh, like this one, were written in Arabic script. And what you have here, it's a submission treaty. So it means that there is a local, a local chief, Sultan, here. His name is uh, Wanda, and he recognizes the power of the, of, uh, of the King Leopold, so the King of Belgium. And so he recognizes somewhere, uh, so uh, actually he signs a document with a, with a European uh, representative of the, of the Congo Free State. And so you have here, an, a, 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 let's say, Belgian uh, colonial document produced in Swahili in Arabic script, saying that uh, this king was given his territory, his land, actually, uh, to the colonial power. So again, even in Belgium, uh, or uh, even in the case of, of Belgium, in the very beginning, uh, Arabic was used by the local, by the Arabs, of course, but also by the local population, and for a short while, even by the Belgian authorities. We even have documents in the royal archives uh, which have been uh, written in Arabic in Congo and sent directly to the King Leopold, who answered in Arabic again because he had a translator uh, working for him. Uh, another case is the one uh, uh, of uh, Afrikaans. Um, this is not Afrikaans. Uh, so in uh, South Africa, you have until now a community which is called the uh, Cape Malays. It's a Muslim community. And uh, those, uh, those Malays, actually they come from uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. And they were sent by the Dutch uh, to South Africa uh, during the 17th century. And when they arrived in South Africa, they came with their books. And their books were written 
uh, their religious books were written in Arabic, and there was an explanation in, uh, in, in Malay language, but transcribed in uh, Arabic scripts. The problem is that uh, they, they, they had no scholars with them, and after one or two generations, they were not able to read their documents uh, anymore. Uh, but they had adopted the language of their masters, which was uh, a kind of, I mean, a, a, a variant of Dutch, which is called Afrikaans until now. And to make the difference between their own production and the production of the, of the, of the whites in South Africa, they decided to write Afrikaans in Arabic script. So here you have somewhere in Africa a document which is written in the Arabic script, but when you read it, it's Afrikaans, which is very close to Dutch. I don't know if some people are familiar to Dutch here, but so it's a bilingual uh, document. So you have the word in, uh, in Arabic here, muqaddima, and then vorwort in, uh, in Afrikaans. And so, bana Allahu al-din al-islami ala khamsi da'aim, and then you have it in, uh, in Afrikaans. Uh, Allah uh, heeft gebouwd den uh, uh, islam op vijf uh, enzovoort uh, and, and so on. So you have a document written in the European language in Africa, but in the Arabic script. That's so. This kind of documents uh, date back to the uh, beginning of the 19th century. Um, a last case, and I will I will finish with this one is the case of the African diaspora. Uh, as you know, uh, most of the, the black slaves who were sent to, uh, to the Americas uh, were coming from uh, Western Africa. And at least since the 18th century, some of them were Muslims. Few of them, apparently, according to the sources, most of them were uh, animists, but few of them were Muslims. And we have found some documents in the American uh, archives in different countries showing that some of those Muslims were able to read and write in uh, Arabic. The first testimony comes from, uh, you know, there was a, a, a very important uh, slave uh, revolt in the beginning of the 19th century in Bahia, in Brazil. And uh, when the, 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 it was called in, in Portuguese the, the revolt of the Malay. And Malay is, is a, um, it's a, it's a Hausa word which uh, comes from muallim in Arabic, so teacher or scholar, somebody who's able to read and write. And uh, why was uh, this revolt called like this? Because it seems that the, the, the organizers of the revolt were mainly Hausa speakers who were able to write messages in Arabic, or at least in the Arabic script. And so during the revolt, when the policemen uh, seized some of the, 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 the uprisers, they have found documents that they kept in their archives, documents like this one. So the copy is quite bad, but this document has been found in Brazil in the beginning of the 19th century, written by an African slave in Brazil with the Arabic script. Another example uh, is the example of uh, uh, Omar bin Said. So Omar bin Said was born in, uh, in Futatoro, in Senegal. He was a Fulani. He was sent as a slave to America, and then he was freed. And after he was freed, he met a, a local uh, um, American intellectual who, uh, uh, when, 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 when he started to speak with him, he realized that he had a, a whole heritage and he encouraged him to write a kind of a short uh, autobiography. And that's what the Omar bin Sahid did. So he wrote a kind of autobiography in Arabic while he was uh, living in America. So you can see that those, I mean, the knowledge of Arabic, uh, which was originally in, uh, in Western Africa in this case, was even, uh, I mean, found back in America. Uh, Another example is this document coming from Jamaica. So I am not telling you that you have, I mean, libraries in Arabic in Jamaica or in Brazil, which, which is not the case. <laughs> but even if we have very few documents, we have enough of documents to, to, to show that some of the Muslim slaves who were sent to the Americas were still able to write and read uh, documents.
So in some cases, those documents have been brought from Africa to America, maybe. But we know uh, in the case of uh, uh, Omar bin Said's uh, biography, for instance, that this document was produced in America and not in Africa. So this knowledge continued somehow uh, to live uh, even uh, outside. So as a conclusion, uh, what can we learn from this African heritage in Arabic? Because, as I said, well, it may be enough to say that um, contrary to what we imagine, uh, there, there was an Arabic heritage all over Africa uh, before and during the colonial period, and that's already exceptional. But as I said, uh, we even have more than this. Uh, some of those documents are original. We cannot find them outside of Africa and then they give us new information from inside. So it means they are not written by Europeans. They are not written by Arabs. They are written by the Africans themselves, and they speak about themselves. And we find some uh, views about historical events, economy, culture, society, but also the language itself the African languages, and the size of the networks. To give you an idea, uh, in the Belgian archives, we have one document which has, found, has been found in Kasongo, Eastern uh, Congo, and which has been sent, uh, written and sent from Zanzibar, which means uh, 1,700 kilometers away from there. So it means that people, people were able to send documents uh, uh, on such a distance. Also, we have found in Eastern Congo copies of the Quran that had been made in, uh, in Istanbul or, or in India, in Bombay. So it means that you have to imagine that a book was published in one of those cities and then sold uh, to, uh, to a trader who brought it to Zanzibar. And from Zanzibar, he was brought to, uh, to uh, Eastern Congo. And just some examples. Uh, in the Belgian sources, we, they speak a lot about, they talk a lot about, uh, um, I mean, an, um, an African leader uh, who was actually killed by the, the colonial authorities. His name is Gongolutete. All the sources we have are written by Belgians, but now we have some documents in Arabic. This one is written by a, an, an Omani trader of, uh, from the area who fought, actually, in Gongolutete. And so, so his name is Monye Mohara. And you, you have here this sentence, Monye uh, Mohara hajama ala khadimak ngongolutete wasah. And so on. So you, you have an Arabic source uh, talking about an event which was until now uh, only described by Belgians. Another example is economy. Uh, you have here a list of goods which are quoted in, uh, in, in this letter. Uh, so you have an Omani trader asking another Omani trader to send him some goods. And thanks to letters like this one, uh, we have an idea of which kind of goods they were sending each other from Zanzibar to Eastern Congo and the other way around. Um, and a last uh, example is a testimony about uh, Arabic dialectology. If we go back to the letter I, I had shown in the beginning, written in Northern Congo. If you read it carefully, it is not, uh, I mean, it's not pure Arabic, you know, it's a kind of Sudanese dialect. I mean, it's what we call Middle Arabic, which is between classical Arabic and spoken Arabic. Uh, and so, ila Ahaz al-Akram al-Sayyid, al-Sahid al-Sultan Zemyo, Tikima, so that's the name of the Sultan. So and so on. Il a des el janib commandant el hakim zariba ango, voilà qu'un ismo le saharaf naho. You see, it's not it's not really pure Arabic, but it's it's a very interesting testimony for the linguists because it it gives it it gives us an idea of which kind of Arabic was used in northern Congo at that period. I thank you.